congratulations, Andrew and his team. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, launch. After all, uh, this is the second launch that I've, I'm part of. I was, I think, part of either the first or the second one. I, can't, I don't uh, remember which. Uh, I was physically in that room where you are all sitting. Um, now, um, let me turn to sort of the substantive mm -hmm. issues, uh, focusing mainly on Asia and uh, sort of since I have only five to seven minutes, I think I'd sort of fo tend to focus more on India. We all, we all know how significant and sharp the, de uh, the decline in, uh, in chronic poverty and extreme poverty uh, has been in China, but uh, most people are actually not aware uh, as to how significant has been the decline in the numbers in absolute terms of the um, extreme poor, meaning those below $1.25 per person per day, um, which is in India called the Tendulkar line, uh, the, the, the raised poverty line. It used to be a little lower than, um, and in fact, we are now thinking of raising it even further. But, you know, most people are not aware, for instance, of the following numbers, that for about 30 years between 73 and, and 2004, 5, there was almost no decline in the absolute numbers of the poor because the population was growing. The incidence was declining, but the absolute numbers were not. However, since in the seven years between 2004, 5 and 2011, 12, we've seen a dramatic decline in the numbers of the poor from 406 million to 268 million. In other words, a a full 138 million people came out of poverty over a seven-year period. So it, that's, that holds out very important lessons, and I'm going to sort of speak to that uh, a little later. But first, let me still speak about, obviously, the 268 million who are still below the dollar twenty-five per person per day. And this is, please remember, this is consumption. This is not income, because that's the way we estimate it. You all know that income is... is uh, systematically higher than consumption is. Um, I won't go into that relationship because uh, national account statistics tend to uh, sort of actually give you much higher numbers for, for um, consumption than our national sample survey, and we actually tend to use national sample survey, so it's highly likely that the, n the numbers that I'm reporting are somewhat conservative. Anyway, let me, let me sort of get back to the substantive point that in South Asia, generally, uh, you know, if, if India has still 268 million, I'm sure there must be at least another 100 million or perhaps even more in the rest of South Asia. And one of the you know, uh, structural problems, as Andy was rightly saying, is the land-man ratio in, in South Asia. Uh, the poor still remain very much in rural areas, and in fact, uh, on account of population growth and on account of the fact that people were not leaving agriculture, uh, the absolute numbers of the poor and uh, sorry, absolute numbers of those working in agriculture were not declining. You you, ha you had seen systematically for 50 years a uh, shrinkage in uh, the, the the plot size, and w what went with that, unfortunately, which is one of the major sort of abiding causes of of chronic poverty in, in India particularly is the shrinkage of common pro property resources. So, you know, government land or wasteland where, uh, where cattle could be grazed by the relatively poor has been shrinking. And that's, that's a major problem. So as, as, you know, farm sizes shrink, it's at least in certain states, for instance, in Kerala, there's been sort of combined uh, contract farming being undertaken to raise incomes. Uh, uh, by small farmers, but you know that requires an, a, a, a role for the state to facilitate that uh, very small and marginal farmers to come together. So this goes back to the question whether in the northern states in India, in particular, that kind of facilitation role can be played by a state which is not particularly effective. So this is one issue: the the shrinking of the size of the of the plot combined with the shrinking CPR. The second uh, sort of, in a sense source of continuing chronic poverty in India, the, which, uh, which, which can remain a constraint and prevent these 268 million in India, um, you know, declining only slowly, uh, is, is the following. You know, development itself and the nature of development. For, what I mean is that um, there are uh, significant uh, sort of significant numbers of poor people in rural areas, especially in territories which are uh, dominated by the scheduled tribes, 
by the tribal population in an arc of the country uh, running along the east and uh, e from uh, along the east and central part of the country. So that as infrastructure projects take up land and encroach on, onto forests where they are residing, or um, you know mining investment begins on a massive scale uh, in those forests where the scheduled tribes are living, you know people get displaced, and the displacement leads to impoverishment. Uh, thankfully, there is now uh, a new Land Acquisition Act, uh, which actually provides for rehabilitation and resettlement. But unfortunately, it's come very late because already some over the sort of I don't know, 50, 55 years of development, we've seen 60 million families being displaced and never really properly rehabilitated and resettled. And these people uh, have low education, almost no skills, so they tend to get exploited. And this is a uh, this is a big issue. So uh, one is hoping that as a result of uh, this new act, they, and when the new government comes to power, the rehabilitation and resettlement of existing displaced people will take place, and that will sort of enable them to begin to come out of of uh, extreme poverty. However, let me turn to the most important uh, reason why we've seen this dramatic decline in the numbers of the poor. You know, non-agricultural employment has been increasing at a very significant rate, which went hand, obviously, went hand in hand with uh, a significant rise in the in the GDP growth rate in the 2000s, and uh, we've seen 7.5 million uh, jobs in in non-agriculture being generated. Now, the interesting thing is that, particularly since 2004-5, we've seen a a structural transformation beginning on a rapid scale in the following sense. You know, the, the, the share of, of the workforce in agriculture had been declining in India. It's now down to half. In China, it's about 38% or so. But the point is that since the last seven or eight years, there has been an absolute decline in the numbers in agriculture, which is uh, you know, phenomenally um, uh, good news. Uh, because what it has meant, it, I mean, the reason why people are leaving in, uh, in agriculture and the absolute numbers are declining is because non-agricultural employment is growing. Now, it's another matter that most of this employment is in construction. Um, uh, but it, 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 yes, it is sort of a migratory labor, but at the same time, you know, wages have been rising. Now, you can ask the question, as I think Andy did, about whether Narega, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, has something to do with it. Yes, it is true that uh, Narega has something to do with it, uh, because it started in 2006. Until then, in the first half of the decade from 2000 to 2005, rural wages were stagnant. Narega sort of triggered a rise in wages because public employment wages were higher. Landless labor, for the first time in their in their lives, had an alternative to working on the landlord's farm, which had the second order effect of actually raising op open market rural wages. So, so both public employment as well as open market wages rose as a result of that. However, that could have been a one-off increase. The fact is that as infrastructure investment was rising, both in rural and urban areas you saw a shift out of agriculture into construction work. So that has sustained the rise in wages across the board in both rural and urban areas. So you've seen a significant rise in rural um, and urban wages, which has raised consumption expenditure and actually reduced the numbers of the poor very significantly. And, and our expectation is that this investment in infrastructure and the employment in construction is con going to continue to grow. But it's not just construction which is, uh, which is absorbing labor. Uh, we've seen uh, sharp rises, in fact, in manufacturing employment. Um, uh, sorry, you know, n not so sharp as in construction, obviously, but still, especially in the last two years, two years we've seen a 9 million increase in manufacturing employment. And of course, services employment has continued to grow. And uh, our estimate is that uh, about as many non-agricultural jobs are being created as, num as, as those who are joining the labor force. Now, let me you know, try and close by making two or three points which sort of try and uh, underline some of the messages from, from the uh, report that has just been launched. 
Uh, at least in the India case, I agree with you entirely that the investment in education has not been enough and, can, and will need to be much greater. Especially, the, the thing is that actually we have been making investments, but unfortunately the input-based approach with more, more schools, more teachers, etc., is not paying dividends in terms of learning. And learning is not is just been stagnant, and that's what sort of survey after survey is telling us, which is a serious problem. Yeah. Because obviously, if people continue to join the labor force, you know, the demographic dividend, you know, people continue to join the labor force with l relatively low levels of learning, uh, then how do you even begin to skill them? Which brings me to that sort of uh, point about uh, transition into the labor market about, you know, there is a recognition in the 11th plan as well as in the 12th plan that there must be much greater investment in vocational education and training. Uh, for sustaining the movement out of poverty, but unfortunately not in, enough investment has been made in this area. One very, very good news in the last several years has been that um, girls who were, remain, sort of, who were dropping out early are actually continuing in school. There's complete gender parity for the last five years at elementary level between girls and boys, and girls are actually continuing into secondary education. However, for them to enter in the lab, into the labor market, uh, you know, outside the home, obviously, outside of agriculture, it's necessary for to skill these people because jobs are getting generated, as I've been saying. They, girls in our country don't really uh, sort of want to go into manufacturing or let alone construction. So, you know, go, uh, very important new courses are introduced in, 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 in services. Let me just close by saying that the biggest risk still remain uh, um, those on uh, those which were emphasized by Andy on, on regard to health, if you want to stop impoverishment, at least in India, uh, because uh, we're still spending only 1% of public expenditure of GDP on health, which is one of, one of the lowest in the world, and simply not, this is simply unacceptable. And if we are going to prevent people from falling into poverty, then out-of-pocket pocket expenditures, which still remain very high, must be cut as, as, as rapidly as possible. On the discrimination uh, angle, you know, I, I'm sure there is a general impression in India about how discriminated the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes are. However, I should tell you that, you know, uh, two years ago we published uh, this, only the second National Human Development Report, and we concluded that there has been, there has been systematic convergence uh, of the uh, SCs and the STs, the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, in respect of the majority of social indicators with the national average. And we've just published an update of, of the Human Development Report, and we find that those trends have been sustained. Okay. And very finally, I just want to say, I want to underline the point that Andrew was making about you know, social insurance. In South Asia, the informal sector uh, share in employment remains extremely high. And uh, as people leave agriculture, the comfort zone of agriculture, their links with land will begin to break down. And it's absolutely critical that the 2008 Act on in Insuring and Social Insurance for the, uh, those working in the unorganized sector is finally put into place. Okay. So we have a lot hanging upon what the election outcomes are going to be in two months' time. Thanks very much. Thanks, Santosh. We're all on tenterhooks for the elections. Uh, listen, uh, two things you didn't say in that very interesting commentary, and I want to catch you on them before you leave. Uh, the first is that looking at mm -hmm. one of the charts that was shown to us, India is one of the countries where more people fell into poverty than escaped from poverty. And you didn't say very much about that bottom end churning problem, and I wonder whether you could comment on it. And the other is whether you have. I a find that. Just let me ask my other question yeah, first, then deal with both. Is, is whether you have a view on what I think of as being the Francis Stewart question, and Francis is in the room, which is, you know, at the margin, is there a choice between growth and human development? In other words, should India, from the story you've been telling, invest even more in growth because that's where the big improvements in poverty reduction seem to come from? Uh, and, or, how, or, or should it invest at the margin in health, education, and social protection, because those are necessary to stop impoverishment. And how do you deal with that potential trade-off in your decision-making? Right. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> okay, let me, let me, um, uh, you ask, of course, uh, of course, not easy questions. It'll take me a, a few minutes to answer that. But let me um, uh, just say uh, on the trade-off that, um, 
In fact, there, there genuinely is no trade-off. One, uh, you, you put your finger on it, one of the reasons why, of course, um, that there's been a massive decline in the numbers of the poor for the first time in the history of India that we've seen an absolute decline is precisely because we sustained between 2003-04 and 2011-12 a growth rate of 8.4% per annum. And our average growth rate in the 10th plan, 2002-2007, to and then in the 11th plan, 2007-12, to was in fact 7.7%, 7.9% per annum, while population growth rates declined to one4 so per capita income has been increasing significantly. So while inequalities might have been increasing as well, hardly surprising, the, you know, the, the growth is what has been driving it. Now, but I, you notice what I said about how uh, this, uh, you know, how this has got translated into, what is the mechanism whereby it got translated into reduction in the numbers of the poor. I said massive investments, both public and private, but m mainly public in infrastructure and also in real estate infrastructure both uh, urban as well as rural so you know you in, in as far as rural infrastructure is concerned for instance rural roads programs are fantastic narega is only one of those things you know the, the then there's the rural housing program and so on so all of that has been driving uh, both in, uh, uh, increase in non-agricultural employment as well as a, as well as a rise in, uh, in real wages, which is what has resulted in the decline in in poverty. So you know there really is no trade-off. I mean the fact that the, the only problem is that we uh, five years ago when the crisis broke, the global crisis, we gave uh, uh, forced fiscal stimuli which were excessive. And now, unfortunately, when growth rates have been declining globally as well as in our country, the the problem is that we don't have the fiscal space to actually pump, you know, pump prime the economy, which is which is a tragedy. So at this point, it seems as though you know there's a there's a trade-off, but in fact, there's there's a beautiful dynamic which I think you would have perhaps understood, which has already put been, which is already in in place, which is the following that as you know, um, uh, uh, it's, uh, as people have come out of poverty, those who've just come out of poverty are actually consuming products uh, 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 which are produced by low productivity firms, small firms, which are actually generating significant employment in manufactured goods of the following kind, uh, you know, processed food, yeah. uh, shoes, sandals, leather, in other words, leather, apparel and garments. Uh, you know, furniture, and of course, mobile phones. Uh, so, so it, you know, there's a there's a beautiful dynamic here, and it's it's a bit unlikely that this this dynamic is okay. going to go away. Domestic consum uh, consumption, consumption, demand. Just, just Santosh, let me interrupt you because other people also want to speak, and I know you have to go. Just one quick word mm -hmm. on le bottom end churning in two sentences. Yeah, yeah, two sentences. You know, I don't. You know, there's not a great deal of panel data. I ha I don't know. Uh, I, with all due respect, I don't know what the, what the nature of that data is. Usually, panel data such as it exists is actually on an extremely small scale in India. So, you know, it can't be, it just cannot be true that at a macro level that more people went into poverty than came out of it. Otherwise, you wouldn't see the absolute numbers declining by 138 million over a seven-year period. So that's my short answer. Okay, and that, that was the thought that also occurred to me when I saw the table, but I was sure that Andrew and Kiara will have a reply to it. Santosh, what time are you leaving us? I'm leaving you now, I think. Okay, well, in that case, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> Characteristically Thank analytical, characteristically indeed. analytical, and 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 uh, fluent. Thank you very much.